alive He's living on the inside Roaring like a lion God's not dead He's surely alive He's living on the inside Roaring like a lion He's roaring oh, He's roaring yes, He's roaring like a lion He's roaring oh, He's roaring yes, He's roaring like a lion I gotta turn my guitar on Hey, look at that it Makes a difference Great that you're a part of Crossview. If you're a guest, welcome. We're glad you're here with us today. Happy that you've joined us. Pray that God will touch your life today and that you'll leave here changed, experiencing more of his mercy and his grace. This song speaks about he's a God of miracles. He's a God who changes us. He's a God who moves on your behalf. Whatever you need from him today, he is a God who sees you, knows your struggles, most importantly, he listens and he hears you. He hears your cries, he hears your struggles, he hears the brokenness of your heart and your life. This song is all about who he is, the power he has for miracles. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me. Moving here in front of me The one who made the deaf to hear Is silencing my every fear Silencing my every fear I believe in you I believe in you You're the God of miracles I believe in you, 
need from him today? What is it that is going on in your life and in your world that you know without him it cannot happen? He's the only source that you can call on. We're going to have individuals come down front. Let's feel led to do this today. They're going to be down front. And whatever you need in prayer today, whatever it is that you need from God, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God is able to do miracles, that God is able to move upon, uh, no matter the situation, no matter the struggle, no matter what you're going through in life. He's a God of miracles. He's a God who sees exactly where you're at. So as we just sing this one little part again that says, I believe in you, I believe in you, you're a God of miracles. If you need a miracle from him today, we'll step out from where you're at. We have individuals down front that will just pray for you and ask God to move on your behalf. If you need a healing, you need a financial touch, you need to move from God in some way, shape, or form, just step out from where you're at and trust that he will come. He will be the miracle you need today. You sing that again. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Yes, you are. I believe in you. Oh, I believe in you. Because you're the God. God, today we just come before you and 
Lord, it's in your presence that we find hope. It's in your presence we find strength. God, whatever obstacles are in our way, whatever the, the hurts and pains are in life, whatever has snuck up on us this past week and just really hurt us, may you come and heal us. May you be our strength. May you be our hope. May you be the one that we bow down to. You be the one that brings us the strength that we need in our hour. We need it the most. So God, here we are. Jesus, you can change everything. God, you change us. You bring us your peace. You bring us your healing. You bring us your touch. Exactly what we need. So God, today, for those who are discouraged, for those who need healing, for those who need just to trust you, God, for a circumstance they're facing, they may not even know what to ask you for, God, but you know May you be their strength. May you be their source. May you be their Jesus who changes everything. Because there is nothing impossible for you. There is nothing too great for you, God. Be their strength. I pray your peace, God, upon the hurt hearts that are disturbed today. 
for the hearts that are hurting today. May you find healing in, in Jesus today. Can we sing that last part? Just sing about the fact that lives are healed and hope abounds. Continue to speak to our lives. Continue to touch us, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. In Jesus' name, amen. of happiness. Uh, we're discovering the true meaning of happiness first and foremost. Secondly, we're discovering that God, that God has a different plan than the world when it comes to happiness. The world tries to say this makes you happy or this makes you happy, and you'll find out that when you go after the things of the world, when you get to the other side, they made you happy temporarily, but in the end, really brought about sadness and sorrow and possibly pain and possibly long-term suffering in your life because the world tries to imitate what only God can create. The world tries to say this is the way it's supposed to work, because the world's always, you ever notice this? The world's always trying to find the shortcut. Always for the workaround. Well, if God says this, then, then there has to be a shortcut to cut God out of the middle. I was talking to someone about this uh, just yesterday. Uh, I was talking with someone about, uh, about uh, it, had to do with, it had to do with money. It had to do with money, and they were talking about tithing. And they were asking me, you know, uh, can you do this for tithing? They're, they're asking me all these questions. And, and here's what I said to them about tithing. I said, listen, you can work around the concept of tithing all you want. But God says 10%, the first 10 always comes to him. The rest is for you to live on. You can negotiate with God all you want. You can try to convince me that you're right and I'm wrong. I'm not right or wrong. I'm just going by what the word says. I said, so the work around is this. If you want to work around to try to escape the concept of tithing by honoring God with your finances, then you will also reap only what you're working around with. So if you try to work around God and you try to figure God out, he'll say, that's fine, you can figure me out, but I can't bless you like I really want to bless you because you're not truly obedient to what I've called you to do. It's called the law of return. The law of return says this, you get what you give. The law of return says that you get what you give. If you give criticism, you will get criticism back. If you get um, judgmentalism, if you judge people, you will get judgmentalism back to you. If you are always trying to work an angle to rip people off and take advantage of people and try to figure out how to make an angle on them, guess what? They will be do the people will do the same thing to you because it's a law of return. What you do to others will be done to you. And the law of return says, but if you're friendly to people, people will be friendly to you. If you're generous to people, people will be generous back to you. If you are merciful to people, others will be merciful back to you, which leads us into our attitude today that we're going to talk about. We've talked about so many different attitudes over the last four weeks. If you didn't get it, 
Go to our crossviewkeekick.com. Sermons are there. You can also listen. You can listen audible or you can watch the video uh, or you can watch the video or put it in the background and you listen to it. Either way, you can hear the message and, and the worship as well. Just go online and check it out. Let's stand to our feet as we read what Jesus is teaching us about happiness over the last several weeks. Matthew chapter 5, verse 2 through 12. Jesus begins to teach and here's what he says. He says, how happy are the humble-minded for the kingdom of God is theirs. How happy are those who know what sorrow means, for they will be given courage and comfort. Happy are those who claim to have nothing, for the whole earth belongs to them. Happy are those who, go, who are hunger and thirst for righteousness or for goodness, uh, for they will be satisfied. Happy are the merciful, this is our scripture today, happy are the merciful, for they will have mercy shown to them. Verse 8, happy are the utterly sincere, for they will see God. Happy are the, those who make peace, for they will be called the sons of God. Happy are those who suffer persecution for the cause of goodness or for the gospel, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And it says this, what happiness will it be yours if all kinds of people blame, blame you and ill-treat you and say all kinds of slanderous things against you for my name's sake? Be glad, yes, be tremendously glad, for your reward is in heaven is magnificent. It says, they persecuted the prophets before you at the same time. In the same way, they were going to pers persecute you as well. Happy are we who suffer, for in the suffering, God brings about his redemption. Let's pray. Father God, may you challenge and change us. Most importantly, may you teach us what it means to be happy. May you describe to us, define to us, uh, destine us for happiness. I thank you, God, so much for those that are here today because I believe that, God, your word is going to speak life. I believe that those who are merciful will find mercy, and as we find mercy, we will give mercy generously to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What is the right way to treat people is what Jesus is going to talk about today. What is the proper way that we are to handle people? What does it mean to have mercy? What does mercy mean? If you're taking notes, write this down. What mercy means this. Mercy is love in action. Write that down. What is mercy? Mercy is love in action moving to an active place. Mercy is not thinking about things that you want to do kindly to people, but you never do them. Mercy is not getting on Facebook and reading what people are saying, but never engaging with maybe a need that is out there. Mercy is love in action. What is mercy? Mercy is what? Love in action. That is mercy. Uh, Psalms 145 verse 8 says this, God is kind and merciful, slow to get angry. Why? Because he's full of love. God is merciful. Even in his anger, he's merciful because he's full of love. So what does a merciful person look like? What are some of the marks or the character traits of a merciful person? Write these down in your notes, and, and you know what? While I'm telling them, maybe you can just check along. You say, check, I got that one. Check, I've done that. Check, I'm on. We'll see how good you grade yourself at the end of the day. All right? All right, go along with me. Here we go. First mark of a merciful person. A person who shows mercy is a person who is patient with the peculiar people in life. I know some of you just checked it off. You're like, done, did it. You know, those, those, those weirdos, those, those uh, obnoxious people, those overly needy people, those relational vampires, you know what I'm talking about? They suck the life out of you. Well, if I'm a merciful person, I'm going to be patient with the peculiar. In October, I, I'm starting a brand new series called Relational vampires. Well, we're going to talk about how to handle these people in our lives that just seem to drain our lives. How does God want us to handle them? All right. Some of you are like, I'm here in October. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Right. We're going to learn how to deal with the relational vampires. First Thessalonians 5, 14 says, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with who? Be patient with, be patient with who? Okay, so that means that coworker. That means that child, that 
spouse, that aunt, that uncle that you think came from a different tree in a different state, you'd have no idea where they came from. You have to be patient with the peculiar. How? How can we be patient with the peculiar? How can we be patient with people that are so different than us? We must, in order to be patient, write this down, we must get to know their story. There's a story behind every person that's a bit peculiar. There's a story behind, I think about, when I think about like, okay, I just use them, this Jim Gaffigan. This guy comes up with these stories, and because he has a story behind him of going to Disney, and we all can relate to it. We understand, and, and, and as we get to know each other, we find more mercy because we find common threads. When we went on a uh, missions trip to Albany, New York, our very first missions trip, uh, I think it was like six years ago, eight years ago, I don't know, it was a long time ago, uh, we took a group up to Albany, New York, we worked with uh, one of my very, very good friends from Bible College uh, doing a church up there, and there was a man that was working with us, his name was Vince, and some of you who went on the trip know Vince, uh, he was one of these, I call them EGR people. Extra grace required, people. He needed a lot of extra grace. I mean, Vince really knew he was peculiar, and he was strange, and he, he spoke when he wasn't spoken to, and he, he would say things that were just like, woo! I mean, this guy, you know, we're in Albany, New York, so it's, it's a little peculiar place anyway, but this guy, he worked with us every day, and man, our team, I had to hold him back from wanting to take him out back and rough him up a little bit. He was just, he was a peculiar guy. But once, as the week went on, as we got to know Vince, we got to understand his story. His story of abuse, his story of neglect, his story of his parents leaving him at a very young age and abandoning him basically to the streets. We understood that there was a man that was struggling, trying to figure out how to engraft himself into a society that rejected him. We never know people's story until we get to know the people. Accept each other. And the Lord, as Christ has accepted us, merciful people are patient with the peculiar. Can we just say that? If I am merciful, say it with me, I will be patient with those who are peculiar. Okay, no one went with me. Let's do it again. <laughs> Some of you don't even want to say it. If I am merciful, I will be patient with those who are peculiar. All right? Number two, second thought is this. If I am merciful person, I will forgive those who have fallen stumbled, sinned, who have missed the mark. I will be merciful. I will forgive those who have, who have done wrong. What do you do when you find out someone's done something wrong? Do you rub it in or do you rub it out? Do you hold it over their head uh, a spouse, a, a loved one, a kid, a father, a mother, a, a co-worker? Do you, do you taunt them with it? Do you just use it as a power to kind of control areas of their life? Or do you release forgiveness for the fallenness that they've been in? When they let you down, do you show mercy? Or do you lord it over them for their life? Colossians 3.13 says, Be gentle. And ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Why is it easy to get forgiveness, but it's hard to give it? Think about that. Why is it easy to receive the fact that Jesus loved us so much, he gave his life for us on a cross, so that we could have the forgiveness of sins? And when we come to Christ and when we wholeheartedly lay our hearts out before him and ask him for forgiveness, why is it that he just so freely says, you're forgiven? And we stand up and we feel the release of forgiveness and we walk away and we're like, wow, I've just been forgiven for all my sins. Everything wrong I've done in my life, Jesus like that has released me from all guilt and shame. And yet... When someone talks bad about us, we can't let it go. I mean, Jesus forgave us 
so much that he saved us from hell, but we can't let it go when someone looks at us cross-eyed. Why is it that it's so easy to get forgiveness, but man, it's so hard to give it away? Well, I think it's because the human condition says, I deserve forgiveness, but they don't. I deserved because I, I didn't mean to do wrong. I didn't mean to do that. That wasn't my intention, but they meant to hurt me. They meant to say that about me. And because they meant it, they're evil. I'm good. They're evil. You guys hear this, hear this dynamic going on here? You hear what I'm saying? Are you, are you listening to me, church? You hear me, everybody? This is the, this is the challenge. We, if we're merciful, we must forgive those that have fallen around us just as we have been forgiven for being failed and flawed ourselves. First character trait, I will be patient with those who are peculiar. Say the second one with me. I will forgive those who have fallen. Third thing is this. The merciful person will help those who are hurting. A merciful person will reach out to those who are hurting. Proverbs 3.27, wherever you possibly can, do good to those who need it. You feel sorry for somebody? You feel like you need to do something? Then you need to act upon it because mercy is love and action. And you need to move out from your comfort zone and do something. Make it happen. Don't call me up. Don't call the pastor up at the church and say, hey, so-and-so uh, needs gas in their car. You need, to, you need to get a gas tank over there and get some. No, no, no. You know what I'll say to you? Um, it took you more energy to call me than to go get a gas can and go take it to them. If God has given it for you to do, go and do it. Because mercy is love and action. Don't pass the buck to me and say, well, I gave it to the pastor. He's supposed to be done. No, no, no. I'm, hey, listen. I, listen. Listen. I'm just like you guys. If there's a card to be written to encourage somebody in the church and you don't have their address, you know, all you have to do is just send me an email or send a church an email or say, hey, listen, I'd like to send a word of encouragement. We'll make sure that that gets to that person. Because why? You need to know that you're the love in action, not the church. It really, really, really does bother me when people feel like it's it's. The church's responsibility to take care of everybody. No, no. It's the church's, that's you guys, responsibility to take care of everybody. So everybody look around. Look to your right. Now look to your left. Now look behind you. Stretch way behind you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now look. Okay. That's kind of tough. I mean, yeah, you looked at the back of their heads everywhere you went. But you know what I'm talking about. This is the church. This is why... View groups are so important. I, you guys have been hearing me talk about this. I've talked about this for years. I believe in the power of small groups of people encouraging one another and moving into another level. In your programs, you'll see a little piece of paper that says Sunday night view groups. Some of you uh, have been coming here for years. And you never got connected, never got plugged in, and maybe you're okay with that. But I'm here to tell you there's another layer of this relationship with God, and it comes through the power of small groups. And so if you haven't signed up, now's your chance. Get signed up for Sunday night view groups. We start at the end of the month. We're going to be meeting it all around different houses around town. Uh, we're, going, we're looking at having four to five groups all around town. Right now we have, uh, we have almost 60 people signed up to be a part of view groups. We want you to be a part of this. And you say, I, I don't want you to ever say, you know what? We don't have the time. Can I just tell you something? You make time for whatever's, whatever's important to you. In life, we make time for whatever's important. You just need to figure out, is going deeper in my relationship with God and my relationship with other people important to, to me? Because guys, one of the beautiful things about these small groups that I've been involved with for nearly 20, 25 years of my life, I have been involved since I was a teenager, I have enjoyed so many different aspects of them. I've enjoyed the relationships I built. This last year, our view group that we had, we had a, a sickness come into our group that's absolutely life-changing, devastating kind of sickness. 
And our group, if it were not for our group, I don't think we would ever heard about it. I don't think we would ever been able to pray about it. And I know we definitely would never have been able to encourage the individuals that were going through the middle of that trial. Because in a church, when you get a church any size and, and even this size, people get lost in the cracks. If you feel you're lost, view groups as your place to connect. Just take a chance and sign up and you will find that you will find a place where you can bring your hurts in and find healing. Okay? All right. I will be patient with those who are peculiar. I'll forgive those who have fallen. Say the, this, this last one with me. I will help those who are hurting. And number four, merciful, I will do good to my enemies. So if you've been grading yourself pretty good on the first three, how are you doing on this one? <laughs> I will do good to my enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 33, 35, 36, it says, If you do good to those who have done good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But Jesus says, but love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great. Be merciful just as your Father has been merciful to you. So Jesus is saying, listen, if you're kind to people who are kind to you, what, what credit is that? You're just being kind to the people who have already been kind to you. But how much harder is it to be kind to people who are not kind to you? Is that not right? How much harder is it for you that whenever you walk through a store or you're walking down the street and um, uh, you're, you're kind of living your life and that person looks like they're having a bad day, how easy is it for us to put our head down and never engage with them, right? Right? Why? Because we think, oh, they hate the world today. I want nothing to do with that. What am I going to walk into there? But how much harder is it for us to say in a kind voice, hey, how you doing? Hey, hi, how are you today? Just a kind gesture to even those who are unkind. And I have found all the time, all the time, that they seem to kind of get lighter. They seem to kind of engage a little bit more. Checkers at Walmart, checkers at Hy-Vee, checkers at whatever grocery store or whatever you're shopping at. You don't know what their day has been like. How great is it for you to be able to be the light of encouragement in their life instead of just another number, giving them cash and paying for your stuff? But this is not talking about those kind of people. This is talking about a, another even level deeper. This is talking about people who have hurt you. How many of you guys have ever been hurt by somebody, raise your hands all across this place. How many of you guys ever feel like you have been truly victimized by other people? You feel like you've been punched hard, stabbed in the back, gossiped about, talked about. Uh, how many of you guys ever feel like you've been stolen from, uh, cheated on, cheated down, cheated up, whatever it is? We're all in the same boat, right? Because guess what? We're all humans. We're all humans. We live in a world full of pain. We all suffer different pains and different hurts at different times. We all have enemies. All of us have enemies. You know who the enemy is today. As I'm speaking, faces are popping into your head. This is my enemy. This is someone I have a hard time forgetting. Maybe it's a job person, someone at your work. Maybe someone's been a jerk to you. Uh, maybe somebody's criticized you or they complained about you or they said things about you. Maybe someone made fun of you in school. I don't live in my hometown. Uh, I live, uh, you know, three hours away from my hometown for a reason. I don't want to run across any of my school buddies because I was, I was made fun of. I, uh, no, I wasn't. I made fun of them. What am I talking about? I'm cool. I'm cool that way. No. I was made fun of. I, uh, I didn't become really well-known and popular until I was like later in my high school years. Uh, but, you know, many of you walk around and you're in a community that you grew up and you're raised and you kind of see people all the time that maybe made fun of you for different traits, maybe said things about you. Maybe there's pain there and literally you would call them, they're an enemy. Well, God says that if we're merciful, we're going to do good to them. 
That means we're not going to ignore them when we see them in the, across the shopping place. We're not going to duck down three aisles across trying to avoid them. You all know, you're all smiling. I see a lot of you smiling because you do it. You know what I'm saying? You ever see that person? It's kind of like if you go to Walmart late at night and you just throw on, the, you know, you just kind of put on your, your, your jogging pants and you're kind of, you're looking horrible. Hair's all disheveled. You're like, I'm just going to run in and get milk and get out. And you see somebody from church or from work. I mean, you literally will do an army crawl down through the aisles to get to that milk, right? Yeah. How do you handle, how do you treat your enemies? Those people who've done the worst of the worst to you, how do you handle them? The merciful will do good to them. So the merciful are patient with the peculiar. The merciful will forgive those who have fallen. The merciful will help those who are hurting. And the merciful will do good to enemies. Why do we do this? Why do we offer mercy to those who maybe are undeserving of mercy? Well, number one, in your notes, write this down. Because God showed us mercy. Pretty simple. Shouldn't I be merciful to other people just as I've shown mercy to you, Jesus said? We're to show mercy because we've been given mercy. We're to show grace because we've been given grace. We're to show kindness because we've been given kindness. The adulterous woman was brought before Jesus, and all the religious people had their rocks in hands and were getting ready to stone her and judge her and say, you're a horrible person. But Jesus instead stooped down. He started right on the ground, and as they asked him what they should do. He said, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Jesus was saying, if you are not a sinner, you're free to throw. But if you have sin anywhere in your life, you better drop it and move on. The Bible says one by one, they dropped their rocks and they left that place because all of them knew they had sin in their own life. How could they judge one when they had sin in their own lives. Jesus was saying, if you've been given mercy, you must show mercy to those who are hurting. So the first thing is we show mercy because God showed us mercy. Second thing is, why do we have, why do we show mercy? Because I'm going to need more mercy in the future. I don't know about you, but I have not arrived. Anybody in here arrived perfect? Anybody perfect in here today? Anybody says, check me out, check, I'm done, I, I'm, I've achieved it, I am perfect. I watch everything I say, I watch my attitude, I watch everything I think about, everything I watch on TV, everything that I put into my life is perfect and pure. Anybody like that today? Because if you are, I need you to come up here and preach. Not that I, I'm not there, trust me, not there. We need more mercy in the future. None of us have arrived the man who says he makes no allowance for others will find that that man, uh, that none are made for him. People hurt me. People say things about me. People come against me. I must understand that I give mercy because I'm going to say things about people. I'm going to hurt people unintentionally in the future. I'm going to probably do things that are going to hurt people. And I don't mean to, but it's going to happen. And so I give mercy because I need mercy shown to me. I give more mercy now because in the future, I'm going to need more mercy in my life. If you've been hurt here today, which a lot of us have, you're struggling with letting it go. You're struggling with showing mercy to them. Can I just give you guys just an idea? I'll paint a picture for you. God says that he is the judge and he is the jury. He will judge every person according to what they have done. When I hold people in contempt, when I hold people guilty of what they have done to me and I hold a grudge and I hold a bitterness and, and frustration and anger towards them, I sit in the judge's seat. And as long as I sit in the judge's seat, God can never take his rightful place to cast judgment on them himself. So literally, you paralyze yourself to the judgment seat where God needs to be sitting because you think you know better. Let me encourage you with something. In your mind, step up, get out of the judge's seat, Go have a seat in the courtroom 
and let God do what only God can do. He judges all men, all women, according to his perfect law. We're biased. We're emotional. We, we cast judgment based on our feelings. God casts it by his perfect law. So why are we merciful? We're merciful because he, we've been shown mercy. We're merciful because we need more in the future. And the last one is because it makes us happy. If you can step out of the judge's seat and you go sit in the courtroom and you just say, God, it's yours, you know what will happen. Your life will have peace. Your life will have transcended peace that only comes from God. Happy are the merciful, for they have received and given mercy. Happy are the merciful. Understand the scripture said, happy are the merciful. It says this, you must first give mercy before you get mercy. You must offer mercy to those around. Some of you here today, the most miserable people on the planet are the people who are bitter, resentful, hold grudges, never forgive. They're the people who are always judging other people by their actions, but yet the actions that they do are exactly the same. The most unhappy people who walk the planet are the people who live in a microscope looking at everybody else instead of stepping back and relaxing in the beauty of God's grace. Ben Franklin said, when you're good to other people, the very best of you always shows through. Proverbs 11:17 17 says, your own soul is nourished when you are kind. It is destroyed when you are cruel. Be kind, nourish your soul. Be kind, find mercy. How do we do it? Two thoughts. You experience God's mercy, and when you experience God's mercy, you're going to give it away. And then start looking at people through the eyes of Jesus. Start looking at them through the eyes of Christ. I realize some of you have been hurt tremendously by the pain in your past. But stop looking at that person through the eyes that you have been hurt by and start seeing them through the eyes that Jesus sees them. And he's moved with compassion for them. You say, they don't deserve compassion. You know what they did to me? You know what she did to me? You know what he did to me? You know what they did to me? They don't deserve compassion. And Jesus looks at you and says, do any of us really deserve compassion and grace? The Bible says we all deserve death because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, through him alone. Patient with the merciful, or patient with the peculiar. Forgive the fallen. Be good to your enemies. What does it matter that the, the, your, 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 your friends be good to your enemies. Help those who are hurting because why? We've been shown mercy. We're going to need mercy in the future. It makes us happy. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, help us today to understand and grow and learn what mercy is all about. God, mercy. We all want it. We all just need it. But it's so hard to give away. So God, I pray that as you move through this place, as you speak to hearts, I know for many here within the sound of my voice, this is a hard message to hear. Because the pain is real. The pain that they have experienced is, is deep cutting. God, I know that there's those and that there are those here today that They've been taken advantage of. They've been victimized. They've been beat up on. There's others here today that have feel, felt abandoned. Feel left alone. God, I don't... I don't know everybody here. But I know you. And I know you're good. 
to know you're kind, to know that even in our pain, even when we struggle, even when we hurt, I know that you're there and I know you love us and I know, I know that you cry when we cry. I know that, that you smile when we smile. I know that you lift our heads up when our heads are down low. I know that God, when we don't know where to turn, we don't even know what to say. God, you're there. And you say, that's okay. I'm here. I see you. I understand. Just rest in me. This morning as we continue to pray, you're here and I just feel especially led just to say this to those of you who are hurting today, two kinds of people today. First off, there are those of you here today that there's pain deep within you, pain that you've struggled with for years pain from your past. Maybe you've been victimized. Maybe you've been taken advantage of and hurt. And it's possibly been done by the people that it's never to be done by. It's supposed to protect you. They hurt you instead. Can I just speak to you today? Can I just encourage you and let you know this? God is there for you. God sees. He knows. He knows the pain that you carry every day. He, he knows the tears that you cry and the, the thoughts into your mind and the, the heaviness of your heart. He knows. Can I just pray for you right now? You know who you are. God, Be their quiet comfort in this time. Be their strength. Be their hope. God, when they cry, you're right there holding their heads. You're right there saying, I got it. I know. I know. I'm here. May they just right here in this moment, may they just feel your peace. And may they begin to feel the healing that only you can bring into their life. Touch those lives. Second kind of person here today are those, there's something that's been done to you or something, something in your past that you need to forgive. You need to be merciful. You need to let it go. You're sitting in the judgment chair. You're sitting as the judge. And God is saying, he's imploring you. He's calling out to you. He is saying, please, please get up. Move to the crowd chair and let me be judge over this situation. And the only way you can do that is you have to trust him that he's going to take care of it. You have to trust him that he will deal like he only can deal with that situation. Stop trying to give God advice about what you think he can do or what he needs to do and step aside and say, God, I trust you. I, I release it to you. I release this individual to you. I release this situation to you. It is yours. It is yours. It is yours. And every time I try to sit back in the chair, may you remind me it is yours. You're here today. You know who you are. You need to stop sitting in the chair in the place of judgment over that situation and that person in your life. And you need to sit and you need to let God take it over. You know who you are. With your head bowed and eyes closed, I want you just to say these simple words. Say, God, I release the judgment chair to you. That's it. And every day you wake up, every day you deal with that anger and that hurt and that pain of that person, you say once again, okay, God, I release the judgment chair to you. I trust you, God. You've got me. So God, thank you. Blessed or happy are the merciful, for they will have mercy shown to them. Happy are we who give mercy, for mercy will be given back to us. We give 
what we give. We get what we give, the law of return. So God, thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen.